good to be with you this morning, mostly to declare the end of my friendship with Leah Jones. Just want to make that public. I had nothing to do with that email. That is not what I'm talking about. Uh, also, for Wednesday, please do come. K Christy Gambrell is amazing. She's a former student, an alum of Covenant College, one of our bright, bright students of the past, uh, thoughtful, intelligent, wise, and also Dr. McDougall's daughter. So do come uh, and benefit from her on Wednesday. The actual thing I'm talking about, it's a kind of another one of these um, dispatches where talking a little bit about some, some work I'm doing, and this is nearing the end of this project on faith and suffering. Some of you have heard a little bit on that in the past. Today's talk is actually called Pain, Confession, and Needing Each Other. Pain, Confession, and Needing Each Other. Two quotes, and then we'll pray. There is an Irish proverb that goes like this. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live. And James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Please pray with me. Our Father, we come before you not because we are strong, but we come before you in our weakness. But we're not just weak. We come before you as sinners, not just generic sinners, but particular sinners with aches, with real sins. We ask that you would meet us even now, in the name above all names we pray, amen. Suffering is feeling the weight of this broken world. Suffering is feeling the weight of this broken world. Josh uttered these words. Josh is a husband of a chronically ill wife who is at the same time also caring for his dying father. Suffering for Josh is not a philosophical debate. It's not a hypothetical question. It's something he faces every day as he looks into the heavy eyes of his pain-wrecked wife and as he tries to comfort his failing father. Josh here is a caretaker, rather than the one who personally feels the physical pain. Yet his presence in their lives is a grace, but we should be clear, all three of them need pastoral care. Annie faced cancer as a young woman. These are all true, by the way. Going through Names have been changed, etc. Going through chemotherapy, she can tell you exactly how many times she was mistaken for a boy. 27. The emotional and physical scars she endured were real. They took her to some real dark places. But in her case, they also opened up opportunities for light, for grace, and for hope. But it would take others to help her and sustain her on this pilgrimage of faith. Samantha has dealt with chronic pain since she was very young. And she's now a grandmother. She's always experienced unceasing discomfort. In her words, she said, I am constantly hurting. Though now diagnosed with fibromyalgia, she's struggled so often with feeling like no one acknowledged her pain. Some of the early doctors actually made snide comments rather than offering genuine belief. Her physical pain was not obvious to the onlooker and it made it difficult for others to recognize, to affirm, to come alongside her when she needed it most. And the truth is it made her very suspicious about other people, but also it made her very suspicious about herself. I have a particular interest and concern for those who face daily pain. 
A fairly accepted common definition of chronic pain is pain, daily pain that lasts longer than 90 days. The idea is if you wake up to, in, to intense pain every day, by day 91, the odds are you don't wake up and be, you're not surprised by the pain. Now, by the way, that doesn't make the pain any less. It just means it's become your new normal. You're no longer surprised by the physical distress. And when the pain is intense, a person often just wants to be left alone. It's a natural reaction. But the truth is, being alone is often not a very safe place to be. For when we're feeling serious physical pain and we're alone, we're actually not alone. We're alone with ourselves, with our thoughts. And the voices inside our head can bring the torrential acid rains of frustration, condemnation, and despair. Exposed to these elements, a person suffering can become almost unbearable. We don't actually need scholars, although they do confirm this. You don't need scholars to tell you that those who face such intense pain are at greater risk of suicide than the general population. When our bodies hurt, we hurt. We may be more than our bodies, but we are definitely not less than them. And part of what happens here is when we hurt, we often feel judged. I want to talk about pain and punishment for a minute. Those unfamiliar with the prolonged experience of physical suffering may be surprised to know or to learn that, that pain and punishment often go together. But to people who have experienced this over long periods of time, it probably won't surprise them to discover that the very language pain, etymologically, historically, comes from the Latin poina, which means, pain means punishment, retribution, penalty. Going back many centuries, there's this undeniable linking between pain and punishment. And I've come to see how common it is for people who are wrapped up in pain to also feel condemned and punished. And I see this as a common Christian experience. It's not actually hard when you think about it. It's not hard to imagine how when you're feeling this kind of thing in one form or another, you can feel like you're being punished for something. I remember sitting across from, a, from one of the most godly couples I've ever known. And as we talked with them, we talked about a miscarriage that had just happened. And it was not their first. And they wondered, was this because of some sin? And so they probed the cracks and crevices of their lives. And do you know what they find when they start to probe the cracks and crevices of their lives? The same thing you and I will all find. Sin. They find sin. We discover pride and jealousy and anger and who knows what else. And here, across from us, some of the most godly people I know and can imagine, we're asking, is, is this happening because God is angry with us from our sin? Well, the truth is, they are both sinners. But the reality is that any of us who examine our lives, if we're honest, will find very frightening things. And it was heartbreaking to hear the kind of cul-de-sac they had found themselves in. Pain and punishment were threatening to be wedded together. Yet it's not simply the sufferer who often makes these connections. We communicate that a person suffering, we often communicate that a person suffering is really the result of something they've done or left undone. To use Christian language, we call that sin. Now, the reality is, um, 
we're pretty uncomfortable with saying, you're facing that pain because of your sin. But the reality is we communicate that all the time to people. Sometimes we do it directly. We kind of wonder, well, maybe did you lie? Did you cheat? Did you, did you steal? Is that, I think maybe that's why. But, but not a covenant. We're way too sophisticated for that. That sounds a little too much like Job's friends. No, in our culture, not, not just covenant, but in Christian culture, the accusations are far more subtle and indirect, though that doesn't make them necessarily any less hurtful. Jim's physical pain is really because he probably hasn't been faithful enough staying away from gluten. If he would just try the new product, if he would just see the specialized doctor I saw. Nicole wouldn't have faced breast cancer if she had just breastfed her ch children longer. If he had just taken one aspirin a day, whatever it is. Now, let's be honest, we don't normally actually say those things to each other's faces, but everyone can sense the judgments and the accusations and the tension. Physical pain comes as a consequence of a person's shortcomings or sin. And in this way, the truth is we have not come very far. We may not use the language of punishment, but it should not surprise us that in such a setting, people in intense pain feel like they live under the cloud of retribution. The accusations come from within, and from without, sometimes subtle, but still real. So what are we to do? I mean, what are we to do? It's tempting at this point, if you have any kind of sympathy, to say, what are you yeah, stop talking about sin. Stop talking about sin. This, no, 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 this is absurd. These people are feeling physically distressed. These people are in intense pain we shouldn't be talking about sin at all we should just be talking about how to get their bodies more healthy i totally understand the sentiment and i love that it reflects by and large a heart of compassion and often it reflects a better theology than a reductive retribution theology which is deeply problematic by all means there's nothing wrong with trying to help people physically get better to improve their health. But here's my concern. Because when we talk about sin and people in pain, because that can easily go sideways for a lot of the reasons I've just mentioned, we then are tempted to go to the other extreme and not mention sin at all. And unfortunately, what I need us to realize is that our fear from hurt, hurting people in this way can then leave us less than fully helpful to those who suffer. I think we should reject this idea of simplistic retribution. But sin is a real problem, even for those in chronic pain. I mean, let me put, this, put it this way. Simply facing chronic pain every day does not free you from sin. Simply facing chronic pain every day is not... Now, here's the other side. Facing pain every day does not make you more of a sinner. What you'll see is we're all in this exactly together. But here's what I have come to believe. Those who face serious, intense pain do tend often to have a heightened awareness of their sin and of the brokenness of this world. So I want to talk about pain and acknowledging our sin. Because our concern is not merely that other people may be judging us. Ultimately, our concern is from God. Is this pain an indicator of God's punishing me? And the question swirl and haunt. Now elsewhere, 
I talk about how I think there are good reasons for Christians to avoid interpreting physical pain as a direct personal punishment from God. I would warn you about trying to give philosophical answers where pastoral presence is needed. I would encourage you to avoid trying to solve providential puzzles when you should embrace mystery. But here, I have become a convinced that people who suffer often have this heightened awareness of sin. But again, listen to me carefully. I don't think this means they're more sinful. I think Jesus is very clear. The tower didn't fall on those people because they're more sinful. We're all in this together. But when you face the turbulent seas of pain, sometimes this heightened sense and awareness of sin and the brokenness of this world palpable it's just right in front of you you can't escape it let me explain what i mean by this and why i think this is the case it don't it doesn't take too much controversy for people to call a two-year-old a terrible two right the terrible twos because a kid in the terrible twos kind of stereotypically we think me 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 they kind of throw a fit they create mayhem when they don't get what they want right the question i have for us is Is a 40-year-old less of a sinner than a 2-year-old? Is a 40-year-old who doesn't throw toys around the office and who doesn't scream less of a sinner than a 2-year-old? Or is it the 40-year-old still wants to be the center of attention? Still, the 40-year-old and the 2-year-old's hearts are eerily similar, but the fundamental difference is the 40-year-old has learned social convention, has learned etiquette, has learned how to suppress and hide some of that darkness. They're just more skilled at it than a 2-year-old. Similarly, sometimes the elderly, as they... As they begin to lose their strength, physical, mental, emotional, you take that situation and then you throw in intense pain. And sometimes, among even the most godly, you will find people prone to words and actions which earlier in their lives would have never come out. You know, a family whose deeply loved and respected patriarch at the end was in so much pain, things were said and done and made it just difficult to be with this person. They would have never said or done those things earlier in their lives. But don't miss this. The reality is you and I, all of us have those proclivities. It's just we have a greater ability to hide them, to exercise some level of control. But when you and I, when we are physically compromised and exhausted and in constant pain, we can't hide it so easily. I know a woman. What if you're like this woman? Every waking moment, Every waking moment, she has a headache. Now I know you're thinking, I have headaches sometimes. No, 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 this isn't like your headache. Well, I don't know what your headache is. But I'll tell you what her headaches are like. To use her language, these headaches every single day are, I want to rip my head off headaches. To quote her, I want to kill myself headaches every single day. There were times when she would have to lock herself in her apartment because it was the only room in the house that didn't have a window and then use her energy to try and block the bit of light coming from the door and then lay on the floor and weep and feel the suffocation of pain. Is it hard to imagine someone in that situation is very vulnerable. When we are physically healthy, not only with our bodies functioning well, but actually we tend to have the energy to kind of keep it together. We can keep it together. But here's what I want you to see. It's not just, we kind of think about it this way. It is true, we can keep it together and present ourselves to the watching world kind of like we're good and upstanding people, things are okay. 
It's far more tricky than that. When you're basically healthy, you and I have the ability to fool not just others, but to fool ourselves. In this room, I don't think I'm going to have difficulty getting all of us to confess that we're sinners, but do we actually believe that, like, real sin, ugly sin, pesky sin is our problem? But when you are in chronic pain or intense pain, those facades crumble and we find ourselves vulnerable and it can be devastating. And in these situations, darkness and depression threaten. Isolation taunts us and the accusations grow. And this brings the vital place of confession. Now, if we had longer, I would talk more about this, but I do want to at least mention it. There is this idea of the value I want to tell you, the value and the limits of preaching to yourself. Right? What are you to do when you feel the weight of your sin on you like a piece of concrete threatening your ability to breathe and to think and to live? Well, it's become popular. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in, in, um, in a very helpful book called Spiritual Depression, famously basically talks about what we call preaching to yourself. And, and Jones warns, he, he says, the, the reality is, often in these situations, the danger is we listen to ourselves rather than we talk to ourselves. And when we listen to ourselves, all we hear are the accusations and the lamb, and lamb blast ourselves and bringing up all, all the negatives and the problems. And he says, no, you've got to talk to yourself. You've got to tell yourself what is true. Tell yourself about the gospel. I don't have time to totally take you through that. I think there is much wisdom in there. I think you can find such pastoral counsel in the likes of Augustine and Luther and Wesley. But I have also come to believe, and I say this because this is so popular these days, I've also come to believe that this approach is insufficient. My concern is part is this prescription is overly individualistic. And therefore, it is inherently unstable. Overly individualistic and thus inherently unstable. Lloyd-Jones says the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourselves. The question is, do we always know how to handle ourselves? Lloyd-Jones, I think at his best, actually gets this. This is partly why he doesn't just talk about talking to yourself. He talks about the importance of things like public preaching. I would like to go in a different direction, as valuable as those are. I would like to talk about the classic Christian act of confession. A crucial act to sustain the struggling saint. Let's talk about confession of sin and the need for our fellow believers. We all need confession because we're sinners. We all need confession because we all need forgiveness we need confession because we need god's word of pardon the assurance of his presence mercy and reconciliation and ultimately ultimately our confessions are made before the triune god and from god we receive forgiveness but here's the question worth asking might it be that we actually need others might it be that we actually need others to, actually, to, to experience the forgiveness of sin that God offers? To believe the forgiveness of sin that God offers? I'm going to draw heavily from Dietrich Bonhoeffer now, his 1938 volume, Life Together. Many of you have read this. For our, our, our time, I'll just focus on three questions that he talks about, and I'll talk about them briefly. Well, this is how I would arrange what he does. The question of why are others helpful for confession? Why are others helpful for confession? Who's qualified to hear confession? And what does confession do? So why are others helpful for confession? Start with a question Bonhoeffer basically poses. Have you ever noticed that it's actually easier to confess your sins to God than to other people? 
It's interesting. Why, why would that be the case? I mean, especially if you say, no, this is a holy and just and righteous God. Why in the world would it be easier to confess to him than to a fellow sinner? And Bonhoeffer, I think Bonhoeffer is right on when he says basically his language is we are deluding ourselves about our confession of, of sin to God. Because what Bonhoeffer concludes is often we're not actually confessing our sins to God. In fact, he says we're, quote, confessing our sins to ourselves and forgiving ourselves. And I think you and I often know that, which is why it breeds a kind of cynicism in us. Because we don't trust ourselves. We feel like, you know what, you're letting yourself off too easy. We don't actually believe. Have we been honest before God? And since... We don't necessarily trust ourselves. We never get anywhere in the experience of forgiveness and grace. Christian confession does not just require sympathy. It requires truth. It demands honesty. And sometimes when we only confess to God, we have to ask, have we been honest with God and ourselves? And basically what Bonhoeffer says is the only way to break what he calls the circle of self-deception, the only way to break the circle of self-deception is with the other. To confess to another Christian, the isolation is broken. Now I have to tell you, as we start to talk about confession, you and I need to be mindful that con Christian confession is not really just about sympathy. And I say this because it will be tempting if confessions happen. You know, if someone comes and talks to you afterwards, it is tempting to, to show sympathy and say, well, I'm sorry about that. Don't worry, it's not that bad. Or to say, oh, everyone thinks like that. No. Christian confession requires truth. If you want to be helpful, actually, then not mere sympathy is needed. Redemption requires truth. And that's why confessing concrete, actual sins is so difficult for me and for you. Because we prefer the illusion that we are pious. We're certainly free from nameable sins. Bonhoeffer pushes us here and he says there is a reason why it's incredibly hard to come before another and to confess. But it's desperately needed. To look into the physical eyes of another human being, a Christian, a fellow saint, to see their eyes, to hold their gaze, and to actually confess what one has done. To confess the ugliness of particular motives or thoughts. To name the burning anger that lights up our souls. To acknowledge the jealousy and pride that makes us cringe at our neighbor's successes and delight in their pain. To be specific rather than beg, Bonhoeffer encourages us, is a path to healing. The Heidelberg Catechism in the 16th century wonderfully in its definition of faith calls about faith and, and recognizing who Jesus is and that he's died for, the sin, for sins. But what Heidelberg does that's so beautiful is it personalizes it. Because true faith admits that the Christian must believe, quote, not only to others, but to me also. God has given the forgiveness of sin, everlasting righteousness and salvation out of sheer grace. Of course, John, Johnny's sins are forgiven by God. I can believe that. But to believe that my sins are forgiven. To believe the shepherd knows my name. That he offers himself for me. That actually is very difficult to believe. And for various reasons, I think it's only with, or it's often at least, with a fellow saint that we can believe it is for us. It is for me. Who's qualified to hear such confessions? Who's qualified to hear such confessions? Well, we can enter into this vicious cycle when it's just us 
and God, where we are isolated rather than part of the community, and therefore we need others to break the cycle. What qualifies them? Bonhoeffer puts it simply, you have to be a sinner if you're going to hear a confession, and you have to live under the cross. You need to be a sinner and you need to live under the cross. Ironically, Christians sometimes act surprised when we hear about real sin. This is where piety becomes the great enemy of faith, hope, and love. As he puts it, for the pious community permits no one to be a sinner. Isn't that ironic? You can't actually be part of a Christian church unless you confess you're a sinner. And yet we're shocked and it shows we don't believe we're sinners. Hidden sins cultivate unhealthy habits and prevent genuine communion between the saints. Now I will tell you, I don't have time to expand this, I think these confessions by and large need to be made to one or two other people. This is not about the whole congregation. But Bonhoeffer understands by meeting with one or two, you meet the whole. You are confessing your sins to the whole congregation through those. Now James will talk about elders and that would be another conversation. But this is something the people of God do for one another. But it's not just recognizing you're a sinner, it's that we live under the shade of the cross and that makes us in a position to offer divine grace to one another. Here Bonhoeffer distinguishes between what he calls the psychologist and the Christian. Now Bonhoeffer's writing in 1938, he's not talking about Christian psychologists, but he's talking about what you might call secular psychologists. But listen to what he says. He says, the greatest psychological insight, ability, and experience cannot comprehend this one thing, what sin is. Psychological wisdom knows what need and weakness and failure are, but it does not know the ungodliness of the human being. In the presence of the psychologist, I am only sick. In the presence of another Christian, I am allowed to be a sinner. We do not need simply therapy. We need forgiveness. We need grace. And it's only those who've experienced such grace themselves that can extend it to others. What does such confession do? In confession, and particularly given how I started, I think others can help us disentangle our pain from the idea of punishment. Here we can know forgiveness and grace even in the midst of our pain. But I will tell you, it is in that that those who are hurting in their confession, we discover the reality about ourselves that we are the sinner. It parallels God's concern for the orphan, the widow, and the poor. And when we don't deal with these folks, we forget who we are. Bonhoeffer says, by confessing actual sins, the old self dies a painful, humiliating death before the eyes of another Christian. This is what, why it surprises Christians when you confess your sin to someone, an actual human being, you feel liberated. It's because for a moment your guard goes down and you actually let others see who you are. Let me close. We've moved to the end here. We often encounter the very presence and healing of God Himself through others. With the physical presence of our fellow believer, believers, light breaks into darkness. And no longer is sin the only reality. Now there is the other, the other who comes in Jesus' name, there to hear, to receive the admission of sin, and to offer pardon in the name above all names. They offer us what we easily fail to offer ourselves. They offer us Jesus. And through them we receive words, touch, embrace, and love. We receive the divine benediction. And through the help of the other, we, whether aware of our sin because of chronic pain, or made aware of our sin because others have helped make us aware of our sin, through the help of others, we can finally receive the bread and the wine, the body and the blood broken 
for you and me. And we might together, together have the audacity to believe it's true. To believe what when we're alone we cannot imagine is true. But together in his presence we can cling to. Please pray with me. Our Father, we thank you for the great gifts of your Son and Spirit. And we thank you that by your Spirit we have been united to your Son. Would you help us not merely to be aware of our sin, but to be more aware of your grace? Would you give us the courage to love one another well in our vulnerability? that we could confess our sins to one another, that we may be healed, that even if our bodies persist in pain or health, we would know forgiveness and grace. Would you liberate us then to love others well? 